Okay, I'd like as if we could uh, to turn in our Bibles to the book of Ruth, please. And we're going to begin reading from Ruth chapter 1 uh, in verse 6 down to verse 18. Ruth 1 verse 6 down to verse 18. So it begins this way. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house, the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters, why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands. Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. If I should say, I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. And again, God always blesses the reading of his word to us uh, as we ponder this wonderful passage this morning. We saw last time that Naomi had uh, lost everything meaningful in sense in her life. Her husband had died. Her two sons had died. Uh, Moab was not a good experience for her. And after 10 years in Moab, she had heard that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. And that uh, hearing of the visitation of the Lord to Bethlehem made her determine that there was nothing for her in Moab, nothing left there for her. She was going to go back. So it says in verse 7, wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Ten years and more of sad memories would flood her mind as she began that long walk back to Moab. Fifty-mile journey, uh, pretty much all uphill, not a very, not a very easy uh, walk it would be for her to take. And, of course, she's accompanied by her two daughters-in-law. We'll think more about that in a moment. But some have called this the, the long path of repentance. It, it has been the path trodden with tears by many a penitent backslider through the years. Uh, we think of the prodigal son. Remember, he had gone to a far country. And you think of him trudging back, hungry, uh, cover, you know, wearing the clothes, uh, that he had been wearing in the pig pen, all the stench of it. What a contrast to his outward bound journey. And yet here he, he is uh, hungry and impoverished trekking back. And there are many that have made this 
long trek back. And it's a difficult trek. It really is. And we want to kind of title this message, really, The Path of Repentance, because that's exactly what she's doing. She's she's repenting of her uh, sin or her waywardness, and she's on her way back. And she had learned the hard way, as many have to learn, the truth of Proverbs 13 and verse 15. And maybe we'll just take a moment to read that uh, that proverb, it's a, it's a very relevant one, uh, and yet it's one that the, the lies of the media and Hollywood would always try to gloss over. They will always try and make it look different, but this is what God says, and this is a true principle. He says, God understanding giveth favor, but the way of the transgressors is hard. <laughs> and it is. The way of the transgressors is hard. This is a universal principle. And she had gone out of the land uh, that had been given to the people, of course, in obeying her husband, but it was, it was a wrong step. And she has found by experience, by bitter experience, that the way of the transgressor is hard. And the world, with all its glitz and all its glamour, is a miserable place for the child of God. And it is a hard place, and it's not a good place for the child of God to be. So verse 8, it says, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. So in this particular scripture, first of all, let me just say there's been a lot of discussion amongst Bible com commentators about and Naomi, was she right or was she wrong in telling her daughters-in-law to return? Uh, some say uh, this shows how way away from the Lord she is in even suggesting that these daughter-in-laws go back uh, and marry into a pagan society. And uh, some suggest even, and I think this is an interesting thought, that it would have been in her benefit for them to go back because as she goes back herself, to, to Bethlehem, uh, if she has those two Moabitess daughter-in-laws with her, it again is highlighting her disobedience because not only was she not supposed to leave the land of promise, neither was uh, she supposed to marry her children uh, to the women of the world, women of the pagan lands like Moab, right? It's, we saw that last time, strictly prohibited. And so the very presence of these two girls uh, would, would be evidence that she had been so far from God, her and her husband, Elimelech. And so, you know, maybe she's trying to cover up sin by telling them to go back. So that's one view. Now, again, that's, that's a view that is held by many. I want to suggest to you a different opinion, that I think that she is being realistic and honest with them, in making them face the facts and take into account all the difficulties and doubtful prospects they would face if they came to Judah with her. They're accompanying her, which I understand again from reading that it was part of an oriental courtesy uh, that they uh, they would accompany the person returning to the edge of the land, just out of courtesy. But she, with the same courtesy, tells them, presses them, urges them to return to their mother's house. Now, we'll think why the term mother's house rather than father's house in a moment. But, but why is she so uh, insistent on their return? What, what is the reason for this? Could it be that she realizes how difficult it would be for these women? Look back, please, to Deuteronomy in chapter 23, Deuteronomy 23 and verses 3 and 4. It says these words, an Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord even to their 10th generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Peor, of Pethor, of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. And so Ruth, or should I say Naomi, understood that for these daughter-in-laws to go back 
was going to be very difficult for them. Just at the, because of the way Moabites were viewed. You can't even come into the congregation of the Lord for 10 generations. And so in her mind, she's thinking, no, this is not the best thing for these girls. I have to go back because I've gone away from the Lord. I've got to return to him. But, but I certainly would not want these girls to face these difficulties. Now, again, we, we want to ask the question, why does she say uh, in verse 8, uh, to her two daughters-in-law, go return to her mother's house. It wasn't the fact that their fathers were dead, because in Ruth 2.11, uh, it, it says that Boaz answered and said to her, it hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. So it's, it, it, she's not saying, go back to your mother's house because the fathers were dead. That's not the reason. But the reason that he says, go back to the mother's house, is that in, again, in these homes at this time, uh, it would, uh, we would have a separation of the house into the women's quarters of which the mother and daughters would do their activities. And so the mother's house would just emphasize that, that sometimes it would be a separate tent or a separate part of the house from the men's facilities. And so uh, she's just saying, go back there in, in her tenderness, uh, go back to your mother's house uh, and uh, take your place there. She wishes them well. She she would she prays uh, for them in a sense in her heart. Says the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. And this word uh, deal kindly is a beautiful word. It's a Hebrew word hesed h e s e d, and it it it's a it's a beautiful word. It's a, it's an interesting study if you ever have chance to do a study on the word hesed, and it's kind of a similar word to to the idea of grace and mercy in the New Testament. And it has this idea of deeds of mercy performed by a more powerful party for the benefit of a weaker one, okay? Deeds of mercy performed by a more powerful party for the benefit of the weaker one. And so she's saying uh, the Lord or Jehovah, he would deal kindly with you. He would show deeds of mercy, would perform them because he is more powerful and you're obviously a weaker. And so the, the idea is that he would step in on your behalf. And so that's her desire for them. In verse nine, it says, the Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. And she kissed them and they lifted up their voice and wept. And so again, she, she encourages them to, to go back to their own land and find husbands. And in doing so, she says, find rest. In other words, marriage is viewed as a place of rest. The Lord grant that you, that you may find rest, each in the house of a husband. And God intends that each marriage be a place and a source of rest and peace and refreshment. Sadly, that's not often the case today in our culture, but it really, it, it can be and it ought to be a place of rest and refreshment and peace. And so that's her desire that they might find that rest from finding a husband that would care for them uh, in their own land and amongst their own people. And notice how they respond and their emotion shows that there was a genuine relationship here with these girls. It tells us that they wept. They lifted up their voice and wept. And so there's clearly uh, during this 10 year period uh, of her being away from Moab and uh, the time of the marriage of her sons to daughter-in-laws There's clearly it's not your uh, often presented typical relationship uh, of a mother and a daughter-in-law, uh, which is uh, which is usually pretty negative uh, in our culture. Uh, you hear all the mother-in-law jokes. This was not one of those type of situations it was seen that there would be quite a, a good relationship and the, the prospect of being separated causes the daughter-in-laws to weep and so in verse 10 it says they said to her surely we will return with thee unto thy 
people. And so her their desire is to go with her. Now, I want you to notice just the, the key phrase in this little section, I should have mentioned it before, is the idea of return or turn again. Notice verse 8, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go return each to her mother's house. Verse 10, they said to her, surely we will return with thee to thy people. Verse 11, Naomi said, turn again, my daughters. Verse 12, turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old, so on and so forth. So, so the idea is uh, of this section is uh, she wants them to return. They want to return with her. And so this is uh, kind of the, the theme of our little dialogue here. So it tells us that she, they, they say that they want to return with us. Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And again, verse 11, Naomi said, turn again, my daughters. And again, perhaps behind this, this, this motivation of recognizing the great difficulties it would be for them to return uh, to uh, the land as Moabites, how Moabitesses, how difficult that would be for them because of the uh, the the attitude towards Moab uh, because of the reasons given in Deuteronomy 23. And the, so then she begins to say to them, turn again, verse 11, my daughters, why will you go with me? And are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Now, again, she's thinking Deuteronomy. Now, I wanted just to see this, that Naomi knows her bible right so her hesitancy of the girls going back is based on deuteronomy 23 and now she's quoting really from deuteronomy chapter 25 and we want to go back there and this uh, what is often called the leverite law uh, deuteronomy 25 and we'll notice uh, verse 5 and 6 Deuteronomy 25, verse 5 and 6. If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him, to wife, and perform the duty of an husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn, which he beareth, shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead that his name be not put out of israel and so she's again appealing to this biblical principle that if somebody uh, was married and the husband died and there was a brother that the brother should take the place of the dead brother and marry the the wife and actually i have literally seen this happen in, in one assembly, I won't say where, where a, a brother died early of cancer and another brother said, uh, proposed to the woman based on this passage and married her. So I've actually seen this literally take place. But what she is saying is, there is no brother. There were two brothers and they're both dead. And so even if today I would be able to have a husband myself and conceive and give birth and of course she's too old anyway but even if i could she says would you wait would you wait till that child was grown uh, surely you wouldn't now again it's purely hypothetical highly improbable if not impossible naomi was too old now to have a husband and sons but she she again is referring to this Le uh, leverite law uh, and basically uh, saying that that can't even work for you. So therefore, they should return to Moab because there's really very little prospect, humanly speaking, for them of ever finding a husband in returning with her uh, to the land of Israel. Perhaps at the back of her mind is an even greater thought that's not mentioned in the passage. But again, I wonder if she's thinking, which 
Israelite would ever even want to marry a Moabitess. <laughs> so she's thinking, this is, maybe she doesn't want to raise that issue because of the delicacy on account of the fact that uh, in our day, she might be considered to be racist to even think that way, uh, that a Moabitess wouldn't be acceptable. And it is ironic, actually, that when we get down the, the road a little bit and we see Boaz, uh, that, that Boaz, his mother was none other than Rahab the harlot, which is kind of interesting. So that would see why he would be favorable even to considering Ruth. But nevertheless, we, we just want to see that she she's thinking to herself, uh, there's no prospects for these girls. The best thing for them would be to return. And so she says at the end of verse 13, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the Lord's, that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. Now, we want to just say this. We want to make sure that we understand this. We're going to see it more as we go to the end of the chapter that Naomi is, is not bitter. <laughs> She's gone through bitter circumstances in God's chastening hand. God clearly, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. We know that from Hebrews 12, chapter 12. She's experienced the chasing hand of God. She's lost her husband. She's lost her sons. And so the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She recognizes this is the hand of the Lord. This is his discipline. But clearly she's not bitter against the Lord himself, because if she was, she wouldn't be going toward him going back to the place where he chose to place his name, to, to Israel, to the land of, of Judah, she'd be going away from him if she was uh, bitter in her experience. And so uh, there's no question in my mind that it's not that she's bitter or angry against God. She would have gone further from him had she been in that condition. But she trusts the sovereignty of God. She's willing to cast herself back on God again in returning to the land. And that's her the purpose. That's her plan. She wants to go back. Now, her circumstances have been very bitter, but she herself is not bitter. And we're going to see that as we proceed. And of course, it's a wonderful promise in the word of God, isn't it? I'm thinking of James 4, 8, where the Lord says to the one who has wandered away, he says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And isn't it just a beautiful promise? The, the idea is this, God hasn't gone anywhere. He's always stayed in the same place. He's not removed himself, but we remove ourselves from him. We, we in our backslidden state, we drift away from the Lord, and the Lord promises us, if you draw near to me, I I'm not going to distance myself. I'm not going to be hard to find. I will draw near to you. And isn't that a wonderful promise for anybody that's in a condition where they, they know they're not where they, they ought to be, that if you would make that step even today, the Lord is there. Just like the prodigal, he's, he makes a decision to arise and go to his father's house. And what do we see the father doing? Isn't it interesting that, that throughout scripture, there's just this divine leisureliness about God's dealings. He never seems to be in a hurry. But the only example we see of God pictured in a hurry is when the father who pictures God the father is running to greet the returning prodigal. Oh, what a wonderful truth of the heart of God who longs for the backsliders and the wayward to return to him. More than we even do, the Lord desires that for the wayward and the backsliders. And so she does acknowledge the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. but uh, And she's experiencing uh, his chastening hand. And again, he is faithful. The Lord's hand had gone out against us. Uh, and so she's, she's now returning back to the Lord, even after his chastening. And it's interesting, isn't it? I remember uh, when our children were younger and we had to administer discipline, and it was always an interesting thing that afterwards they would just snuggle up in your lap. <laughs> it was an interesting thing. Uh, they just, they, they, it almost seemed like they, they, they appreciated the affirmation of love after a time of discipline. And so this is the picture here. And so verse 14, it says, they lifted up their voice and wept again and 
Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. So while Ruth clung to Naomi, Orpah kissed her again. And then we read these sad words in verse 15. She said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back to her people, to her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. So Ruth clings to Naomi, but Orpah kissed her again. And following uh, these words, she, she goes back. She's never heard of again. Orpah is just disappears off the pages of scripture. She returns to Moab, to her own kin, to idolatry, and to historical oblivion. She's gone. We never hear more of Orpah. But Ruth, we hear about all the time, as we said last week, even in the Jewish festivals, the book of Ruth is read during the Feast of Pentecost, yet Orpah uh, just disappears off the scene of time, which just shows us the awesome consequence of choice. I want to suggest to you that what Naomi is doing has a New Testament kind of equivalent. Naomi is saying to these girls, the 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 seriousness of following the lord the the cost of if we like the cost of discipleship do you realize the the true cost of this decision you're going to make and it's good isn't it to do that remember the rich young ruler came to the lord jesus the lord loved him but he told him the cost you want to follow me you can't have any other idols or gods in your life you've got to turn away from them and of course, he went away sorrowing. He wasn't willing to pay the price. And so, and it's a good thing, isn't it? That even as we share the gospel with people, we want to be honest with people. There is a cost in following the Lord Jesus. Uh, it, it does include, now the blessings are wonderful, but there's a rejection that comes. There's Often there can be a family rejection. Often there can be a rejection from friends. Uh, the, following the Lord is not easy. And so Naomi is saying, if you come with me back to God and back to his land, there, there's a price to be paid. And she's, she's really emphasizing this, the awesome cost of, of, of choice, but the awesome co cost of following Christ, uh, of true discipleship. And so she, she says again, to, the second time to Ruth, behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back to her people, to her gods, Return thou after thy sister-in-law. You go back too. But here we get Ruth's statement. Now, this is one of the most amazing statements of Scripture. And it's interesting. We mentioned at the beginning of our study last week that these two books that are named after women, Ruth and Esther, and both of them have tremendous Scriptures that speak of commitment and dedication. Uh, in the book of Esther, We've got Esther 4, 16, where she, she faces this decision. Do I go into the presence of the king without being invited? It, it could cost me my life. And yet, remember, she says, if I perish, I perish. In other words, she makes a huge commitment decision with amazing consequences. Well, Ruth is going to make a huge commitment decision here. Uh, even after the warnings, even after being told the difficulties that she would face, uh, the prospects were not good. And yet she says, verse 16, Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people should be my people. Thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die. There will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also. If all but death part thee and me what a wonderful wonderful decision this woman is making here it was more than a change of address ruth is saying i am willing to forsake the moabite gods i grew up with and embrace the god of israel she was deciding to follow the lord your god shall be my god this gentile woman once far from God, is making a decision to draw near to him. And she says, your God will be my God. Meant that Naomi's relationship with God, by the way, had somehow made an impact on Ruth, even though she's far, far from where she should be. After all, 
Naomi did not have an easy life. She had lost her husband. She had lost her sons. And she believed that all of this was caused, this calamity was caused by her disobedience to God. And yet, still in the midst of all that, she still obviously loved and honored the Lord because Naomi, uh, for Ruth to say to Naomi, your God will be my God. There had to be something attractive about this that caused her to, to, to make that decision. There had to be something in her life that made her say, I want your God to be my God. And I wonder, do people look at our life, even though we go through the same trials? And sometimes we wonder, you know, the Lord's people, you know, unsaved people get cancer, we get cancer. Uh, unsaved people uh, lose their jobs, Christians lose their jobs. I mean, this is, we're, we're part of this fallen scene, but how we respond to life's difficulties can have a tremendous impact on those that are watching. And people should be able to look at your life and my life. And just as Ruth looked at Naomi's life and say, I want your God to be my God. <laughs> your trust in God and turning towards him in tough times is drawing me to want a relationship with that God. And so she says, where you die, I will die. Your God, my God. Ten years. It's interesting, though, isn't it? Ten years of Naomi's compromise in Moab never made Ruth make this confession of her allegiance to the God of Israel. She watched, and she clearly saw some things that were attractive, but she never personally made that commitment herself in all of those ten years. But the minute Naomi stood and said, I am going back to the God of Israel, I'll put my fate in his hands. Ruth stood with her and said, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to put my fate in the hands of your God. And so sometimes when we're in a compromised state, even though we still may have an impact on people as they watch us, it's, it's often when we make a bold stand for Christ that others want to make that same decision. It's hard to win a soul to the Lord when there's compromise in our own life. But once we make a decision, this is a quote from Spurgeon, it's a decision for Christ and his truth that has great power in the family and the greatest power in the world too. And so at this moment, Naomi says, I'm going to follow the Lord. And then Ruth says, I'm going to follow the Lord. And then she said, the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. She had very little knowledge of the God of the true God of Israel, but she, she did know that he was a God of fairness and justice. And that he could be called upon to hold her accountable. She said, the Lord do so to me if, if I don't fulfill my promise. She, she knew, I guess she'd seen God's discipline of her mother-in-law. And so she makes this decision. Now, let me just run through some things here before we leave these two verses. It's a tremendous expression that Ruth makes. It's a, a, an expression of discipleship. Where thou goest, I will go. Remember the Lord in Matthew's gospel, chapter 8, in the context of discipleship. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 19. Matthew 8, 19. And a certain scribe came and said to him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And so, uh, again, we just get this idea that uh, it, it really is a statement of discipleship. Wherever you go, I'll go. The Lord says, you want to go where I go? Well, you may not have a bed to sleep in. Foxes have holes. I don't have anywhere to sleep. You want? You really want to follow me? And you realize the cost involved? And yet Ruth has been warned by Naomi 
This is not going to be easy. It's not going to be an easy decision to, to, to come back with me uh, to, to the land of Israel. And yet she makes this discipleship decision. Wherever you go, I will go. And then it was a decision of fellowship. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. See, I'm, I'm going to just stay in close fellowship to you. <laughs> wherever you lodge, I'm going to lodge. Where, wherever you, I remember years ago reading C.H. McIntosh and uh, being so blessed. I didn't know anything about assemblies, but I, I read C.H. McIntosh and I said to my wife, wherever this man hangs his hat, that's where we need to be. <laughs> and eventually we found ourselves in assembly fellowship. Isn't it interesting? Wherever you lodge, I'll lodge. I want that fellowship. I want that that fellowship with you to continue wherever you lodge our lodge the relationship your people shall be my people i'm going to enter into a whole new relationship changing and isn't that interesting when you get saved in a sense you you have a whole new family a whole new relationship the old family may reject you may not want anything to do with you but you have a new family a whole new relationship the family of god so he says your people shall be my people a whole new worship your god shall be my god Gone is Chemosh of the Moabites. Gone is Baal that the Moabites also worshipped. No, your God will be my God. A new worship and a, a new lordship. Lord, do, do so to me and more also, if all but death would part thee and me. In other words, I'm going to follow the Lord right to the very end. And so... This is a tremendous, tremendous confession that Ruth makes. And of course, the consequences are going to be absolutely enormous. You notice, too, that as Ruth makes this confession, she, she obviously had been taught things about God by Naomi, because notice... Thy people shall be my people, thy God, thy Elohim, my God, my Elohim. And then where thou diest, will I die, verse 17, there will I be buried. And the Lord, Jehovah, do so to me, and more also, if all but death part thee and me. So even in her backslidden state, Naomi had clearly at least in part, explained the names of God to Ruth. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, a backslidden Christian still knows more than the average non-Christian and can even teach things to uh, uh, unsaved people. Uh, they, they know what the truth is, even if they're not walking in it. And so this this girl from Moab makes a huge decision. It will affect her future, affect her faith, her family, her friends. But she is resolute in her choice. In fact, so resolute, verse 18 says, and when she saw, this is Naomi saw, that she was steadfastly minded to go with her. Then she left speaking unto her. Oh, isn't it wonderful? to be steadfastly minded, <laughs> to be steadfastly minded. And you, you read these examples in the word of God. Uh, Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's meat. Would you say that he was steadfastly minded? I think he's absolutely determined. I'm not going to do this, right? He made a decision that was a huge decision. And these decisions, the early church made some huge decisions. They determined that they would continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and breaking of bread and fellowship and prayers. And there, there's a there's a there's a, a determination at, at the at the level of the will to follow the Lord. Or oh, how we need that kind of determination today. There, there's so many people who are just easily put off, easily distracted, easily taken away from things they know they should be doing. And oh, how wonderful when, when we become steadfastly minded to follow the Lord, steadfastly minded to obey his will, 
steadfastly minded to, to meet with the saints, steadfastly minded that we won't defile ourselves with the wicked things of this world. Oh, how good it is to be steadfastly minded. And so she makes this incredible and important decision. Someone has said that in this little section, Naomi was grieving, Orpha was leaving, and Ruth was cleaving. Now, I couldn't say that any better, but let me say it again just in case you didn't get it. Naomi was grieving, Orpha was leaving, but Ruth was cleaving. <laughs> Isn't it good to cleave unto the Lord with all our hearts and minds and souls and follow him whatever the consequences? And so verse 19, so they went... That, so they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And this is that final section. And move, we, we've seen movements here, right? We went, we saw this first uh, three verses that was that, uh, our first five verses, a movement from Bethlehem. It was a costly departure. Verse six through 18, a movement to Bethlehem. And how this longest section in the chapter uh, deals with this whole uh, idea of returning to the Lord, uh, because God loves this when people return to him wayward and backsliders. So this lengthy section deals with this. And then now a movement in Bethlehem uh, at, the, at this decision, verse 19. So they went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? There's a long walk for the two of them from Moab to Bethlehem. And as I mentioned earlier, the trip is mostly uphill, over 50 miles through difficult territory, including crossing Jordan. We can imagine along the way, Ruth was asking her mother-in-law, Naomi, all about the God of Israel and the land of Israel. Tell me what it's like. What, what's Bethlehem like? You know, what are the people like there? Because she's never been. It's it, She's just going based on the testimony of her mother-in-law. So she's asking these. And so you can imagine their conversation as they walked on the way together. And then as they come into the city, it says all the city was moved. They were ex There was an excitement in Bethlehem. It wasn't a very large city. In fact, remember it says in Micah 5, 2, the littlest among the thousands of Judah. So it's not a, it's not a big place, uh, Bethlehem. But everyone in, in, in the community would have known and remembered when this family had left. People have long memories in these communities, and they remember these things. They remember uh, when Elimelech took his family in that famine time to Moab. And now they see that Naomi is back. And so there's a, there's a great stirring amongst the people, great discussion. Is this Naomi? And in verse 20, she said to them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly, bitterly with me. Naomi means pleasant. Don't call me pleasant. Mara means bitter. And so she's, she's telling the people of Bethlehem that her time away from Israel, her time away from the God of Israel, had not been pleasant. It was a bitter experience. She, she's not a phony. She's not returning back and pretending that everything was rosy in her time away. She, she's been honest. She's, she's been transparent. It was a bitter experience being away from God. And I think it's important when, uh, when people come back to be honest about being away from the Lord, that, that it's not a pleasant experience. And so uh, she's, she's saying, here I am, and my life has been bitter. Moab had left its mark on Naomi. And the world leaves its mark on the soul and life of the Christian who is wayward and away from the Lord. Now they, come, they can come back. They can be accepted and forgiven and restored and yet the marks will still be there. Uh, and so she's got the mark of Moab upon her. And she said, it's been a bitter, bitter experience. She says in verse 21, I went out full. 
and the Lord hath brought me home again, empty. Now, again, I'm saying she's not bitter against the Lord. She's just been honest about the chastening hand of God. And so she went out full. She had a husband. She had two sons. Uh, she obviously had sufficient funds for the, for the journey and to set up in the new place where they went. And so they went out full, but they've gone again empty. It's kind of just the opposite of Jacob's story. Remember when Jacob went uh, to Laban and he, he, he confessed, he said, I, I came empty, didn't even have a pillow to put his head on, but he came back full. Well, she has the very opposite experience of Jacob. She's coming back empty, although she's not really been fully accurate because she's brought with her a daughter-in-law. And that daughter-in-law is going to be the means of amazing blessing to Naomi. Uh, she's going to be responsible to filling her cup in many, many ways. And see, she'd lost a husband, she lost two sons, and she lost one daughter-in-law. She'd lost all kinds of material possessions. And all she has now is one daughter-in-law, Ruth. But through that one thing she had left, God is going to bring incredible blessing to her life. All the good that happens in the future chapters begins here. It begins with Naomi's godly repentance and honesty. <laughs> That's where it begins. It'll make a difference not only in her life, but in the life of a daughter-in-law and the destiny of the nation of Israel. And it is true, isn't it, that the pathway to blessing is always brokenness. The pathway to blessing is always brokenness. Unless we, we go through the valley of brokenness, we'll never come in to the time of blessing. And it's when she acknowledges, I went out full, the Lord hath brought me home again empty, and why call you me Naomi, seeing the Lord has testified against me? Again, she's recognized this is God's hands. The Almighty, the Almighty hath afflicted me. She's acknowledging God's chastening hand upon her life. But nevertheless, it says Naomi returned. And isn't it good? It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? When somebody has gone away from the Lord, has experienced his chastening hand, and when they returned, it's always a wonderful thing. And not only did Naomi return, Ruth the Moabites, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. That's going to have significance. It's in the time of April. It's a time when God's bounty is first begins to be seen in the land of Israel. A time of festival as well, where people bring their full baskets to the Lord uh, to acknowledge his goodness to them. Uh, and uh, you, you get a glimpse again in, of this in Deuteronomy chapter 26. Let me just read there. Deuteronomy 26, where these harvest festivals, their times of bringing the blessing to the Lord. It shall be when thou art come in unto the land, verse 1 of chapter 26, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance and possessest it and dwellest therein, that thou shalt take of the first of all the fruit of the earth. And the first crop of the year was the barley harvest, which thou shalt bring of thy land that the Lord thy God giveth thee and shall put it in a basket and shall go to the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name and so on and so forth. And so, again, I want to suggest to you that this is the time she arrives. It's a time when the people have got full baskets. And what does she have? She has an empty basket. She doesn't have it. She will. Uh, she's going to, we're going to see in the next chapter, she's going to have, uh, she's going to have her fill. But at this moment in time, she's coming empty. I went out full. The Lord hath brought me again empty. And she comes at a time of fullness, the beginning of barley harvest. And it's going to be the turning point for her. Everything's going to change. God is going to come in and blessing. 
but before he can come in and blessing, she has to come to this place of brokenness and repentance. She has to draw near to God before he will draw near to her. And so again, we don't know who's going to listen to this, but it's, an, it's a great encouragement for anybody that's away from where they ought to be to turn back to the Lord. Oh, it's a wonderful thing to turn back to the Lord. And yes, it will cause a stir amongst the people of God in a good way. Uh, people of God will be so glad to see you restored. And the Lord will run to meet you. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.